بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعود لله ونعود لله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلل فلا هدي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه أما بعد فإن أفضل الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدى نبينا صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار in keeping with the hadith and the instruction and command of our Prophet and our Nabi Abu Qasim al Mustafa al Amin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said, Man lam yashkur al nas, lam yashkur illah. Whoever does not think the people, he has in fact not think Allah. In keeping with that hadith, we want to thank the administration here at this masjid for allowing us to come. Because what we're trying to do now is we're trying to break down the walls and the barriers that the Muslims have allowed to be erected that keep us divided amongst ourselves. Especially at a time when we're the last group of people who can afford to be divided amongst ourselves. So those language barriers, those cultural barriers, the barriers of the madahib and the imams that we follow, the Muslims have to rise to the occasion and the challenge of trying to unite themselves and expose themselves to other people who may have information that is going to be beneficial to us. We would like to also thank and acknowledge the efforts of those brothers who were responsible for organizing this particular reminder. We ask Allah in this blessed month to put their efforts in the Mizan of Hasanat Yomu Qiyama. I want to give myself a reminder and give all of you a reminder as well about a critical issue, an important issue, something that is extremely practical that you can begin to do today. We should have been doing it all a while, all alone. But the Shaytan, who is our open and our avowed enemy, many times he makes us become neglectful about simple things that if we were to do them we can get a lot of the problems solved in our lives and that is I want to talk to you brothers here inshallah and the sisters about the importance of a dua this ummah right now and every single individual who is sitting here right now we're being faced with some issues we're being faced with and we're dealing with issues challenges that no one here has the ability to solve his problem except with the help of Allah. And despite that fact, you will find the person, he doesn't make dua to Allah even though the dua is the weapon that Allah has equipped every Muslim with. The weapons of the so-called superpowers, they pale in comparison to the weapon of a dua because the weapon of the superpowers, atomic bombs and other than that, high-tech jets and other than that, they cannot be effective if the Lord of all the worlds doesn't want it to be effective. So if a person is utilizing the dua, he's going to empower himself to solve a lot of his problems. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said about the dua, a dua huwal ibadah. Dua in and of itself, it is ibadah. It is worship. And then he read an ayah from the Qur'an in which Allah called the dua ibadah. After telling the people, a dua will ibadah, dua is ibadah, he read the ayah in which Allah said, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أَدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَقْبِرُونَ عَنْ إِبَادَةِ سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ الدَّاخِرِينَ And your Lord has said to all of you, call on me and I will answer your call. Verily, those people who are arrogant as it relates to my ibadah, meaning dua. Those people who are arrogant as it relates to my ibadah, my dua, they will enter into the hellfire and they will be loved. So, ikhwani, 
In the religion of Al-Islam, we have a Lord who has created us, and He created us so that we may worship Him. And He told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about Allah Azza wa Jal, مَن لَمْ يَدْعُ اللَّهِ يَغْدَبُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ Whoever doesn't make dua to Allah, Allah becomes angry and is angry with that individual. And that's for two reasons. Why does Allah become angry with the one who doesn't make dua? The first reason is because the one who doesn't make dua to Allah is a sign of kibber. He feels and he sees himself as being self-sufficient. So whenever there's a problem that's going on, he wants to solve his problem using his resources, his money, his jah, the people he knows, his intellect. Instead of turning to Allah, he wants to solve the problem with his mind and his resources. So he sees himself as being self-sufficient. And that's not acceptable because Allah from his name is that he is mutakabbir. And anyone who has an iota of kibbir in his heart, he won't enter into Jannah as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu narrated in the hadith as in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet told us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam من كان لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من كبر. The one who has a speck of kibber in his heart won't enter into Jannah. It's haram. Only Allah has the right to be mutakabbir. So some of the Muslims, unfortunately, they look at this man and they say because he doesn't have a degree, I'm better than him. He looks at this one. He doesn't allow his daughter to marry this one. He doesn't allow this one. All of this kibber that we have amongst ourselves and then we have the nerve to turn around and to say the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. No. The Muslims are their own worst enemy with the arrogance that we have amongst ourselves. So, Allah becomes angry with the one who doesn't make dua. And why wouldn't he make dua? As I mentioned, most of you I don't know. But I can guarantee you there's not a single person sitting here except that he has an issue or issues that he needs Allah's help. The mother is sick. He's looking to get married. He's on the brink of getting a divorce. He doesn't have money. His child is going astray. There's not a person here except that he needs the help of Allah. And yet, he doesn't make dua. مَن لَمْ يَدْعُ اللَّهِ يَغْضَبُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ Whoever doesn't make dua to Allah, Allah is angry. Because he may be mutakabir. A second reason why a person doesn't make dua to Allah and Allah becomes angry as a result of that is because the person is ignorant. The person is ghafil. He's not paying attention. And Allah doesn't love the mutaghafilin. He doesn't like the ones who are ignorant. He doesn't like the ones who are not paying attention. They're sleeping. Each day is passing and death is becoming an issue that's a reality. He has gray in his beard. His hair is gray. That's an indication that he's close to his cover. And yet, he's not cognizant about why he should be making dua. So whoever doesn't make dua, Allah is angry with that individual. So I've come here today, inshallah, to remind you brothers and you sisters and myself about the importance of a dua. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as Allah described him in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرُجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا You people have in the Messenger of Allah a perfect example for the one who hopes to meet Allah and he believes in the last day. So if you want to be a doctor, you have in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a perfect example. You want to be a businessman, you have in him a perfect example. You want to be a husband, you have in him a perfect example. You want to be a student of knowledge, you have in him a perfect example. You want to be the imam, you have in him a perfect example. You want to be a wife, you have in him a perfect example. You have a perfect example in him in everything. So when we look at his life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we find from the time he woke up in the morning to the time he put his head back down on the pillow, his life was filled with dua, 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 dua. Waking up, dua. Putting on his clothes, dua. Going out the house, dua. Going into the masjid, dua. Going into the bathroom, dua. Dua, dua, dua. Take the average Muslim and tell him, what's the dua of waking up? He doesn't know. What's the dua of putting on your clothes? He doesn't know. What's the dua of eating? He doesn't know. 
You want to protect your child before having relationships with your wife, Akramakum Allah, there is a dua that if the person say, says it, his child will be di- divinely protected from Allah. During this day, the spread of mental illnesses is on the rampage. Serious mental illnesses to minor. Schizophrenia, anxiety, depression. There is a dua that if a person suffers from depression and anxiety, if he says this dua, it will take away his, oppression, his depression and anxiety. But the Muslim doesn't make the dua. And then we claim we love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in fact, we do love Rasulullah. I'm sure of that. We do love him. But as Allah mentioned in the Quran, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِئُونِي يُحْبِرُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذَنُوبَكُمْ If you people truly love Allah, then follow me. Allah will love you and He'll forgive you for your sins. So loving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is manifested in the way we behave and the way we act. When the sunnah comes to you, especially amongst our elders who we respect, when the sunnah comes to you and is different from what you grew up thinking was correct, are you an individual who repels the sunnah and you're against the sunnah? When the hadith comes to you from the authentic sunnah, are you an individual who says, but my culture, we don't do that. But my imam, he said something else. They asked our imam, al-imam al-nu'man ibn al Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. Ya imam, what's your manha? What is your manha? He said, إِذَا صَحَّ الْحَدِيثِ فَهُوَ مَذْهَبِ If the hadith is authentic, then that's my manha. So loving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is manifested in spreading his sunnah, defending his sunnah, practicing his sunnah. When his sunnah comes, we throw everything else out the window and we establish what Rasulullah brought sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So ikhwani, brothers and sisters, learn those dua that if you were to say them, the dua of eating. الحمد لله الذي أطعمني هذا الطعام ورزقنيه من غير حول مني ولا قوة هو بسجد الدعاء قال صلى الله عليه وسلم غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه he will be forgiven for what went past from his sin one of us doesn't even say بسم الله before we eat and that's how most of the dua are they're easy to memorize, they're easy to say, and the reward that comes as a result of them are tremendous. So in talking about the dua, the importance of dua, and the etiquette of a dua, and reminding myself and you all, I want to deal with this issue by dealing with one of the surahs of the Qur'an. And this way, inshallah, we can hit two birds with one stone. In the month of Ramadan, the month of Barakah. We want to talk about the importance of dua and the etiquette of a dua as a result of what is mentioned in Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha. That surah that we read every single day. And yet if you were to ask the average Muslim, Allah says in Surah Al-Fatiha, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim both of those names of Allah comes from the word Rahma. But what is the difference between Allah's name Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim? Ask the average Muslim, he doesn't really know the difference, even though he says it every day. Ar-Rahman means that Allah is most merciful to all of his creation. He's merciful to the jinn, to the malaika, to the insects, to the animals, to the kafir, to the Muslim, the man, the woman, the Arab, non-Arab. The faithful, the religious, the irreligious, the scholar, the ignorant. He is Ar-Rahman. He gives us the indiscriminate wind. He gives us water. He gives us food. Provides all of these things for everybody. Ar-Rahim, he is most merciful only to the believers. Yawm al-Qiyamah. He will not have any Rahmah for the person who died making shirk. No matter who they are. No matter how close they were to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or to Ibrahim he won't have any rahmah 
His cousin Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu asked him, Ya Rasulullah, your uncle, your uncle, Abu Talib, he used to protect you in your religion. What did you do for him in retribution of him protecting you in the religion? Rasulullah said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because of me, a pair of shoes will be made for him in the hellfire. He will be called to put his feet in those shoes, and from the severe blazing torment of the shoes, his brain is going to bubble. And that's his recompense until the end of time, forever and ever, and that's the least amount of the punishment of the hellfire, because he died on a ship. So Allah will not have any rahmah for a non-Muslim after Yawm al So that's the meaning of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. In Surah Al-Fatiha are a number of treasures, ikhwani, that I want to bring to your attention. From them, it shows us the etiquette of a dua How to make dua. Why did I choose Surah Al-Fatiha? First of all, there's an authentic hadith that was collected by Imam Al-Bukhari. On the authority of Abu Sa'id al-Mu'alla radiyallahu anhu. Rasulullah came into his masjid sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he saw that companion and he said, Ala u'allimuka a'zam suratin fi kitabillah qablin takhruja min al-masjid. Shall I not teach you the greatest surah of the Qur'an before you leave the masjid? That man said, yes, ya Rasulullah. So Rasulullah left the man and he became preoccupied and he was doing things. When it was time for him to leave the masjid, he began to leave and exit the masjid. That man, Abu Sa'id al-Mu'alla, grabbed him by his arm and said, Ya Rasulullah, do you remember you told me before you would leave the masjid, you were going to teach me the greatest sword of the Qur'an? Which is an indication and a proof that the companions, they were interested and concerned about learning their religion. He wants to know, not like the Muslims today. Our religion today is a religion where if an issue comes, I'll go and I'll ask the Malvi Saab. If an issue comes, I'll go and I'll ask the Imam, or the Musti, or the Qadi. As for me sitting and learning my religion, nah, when the time comes and an issue presents itself, that's when I'll deal with it. The Prophet described the Muslim. Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيدَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مَسْلَمٍ Hello, whoever's got an NREG Jeep, can you move it because brother's blocked in? And whoever else is blocked, anyone else in or parked in a silly position, can you please, please correct it? Because we don't want to stop the shake again. Okay, so. Ikhwani. So the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed all of us searching for knowledge is an obligation upon every single Muslim. Whether you can read and write or whether you are illiterate, you have to come to learn about your religion. Man yuridillahu bihi khaira yufakkahu fi deen. If Allah wants good for an individual, He teaches him the religion. So everyone in the masjid, our daughters, our wives, our sons, ourselves, we have a religious obligation to learn this deen. doesn't mean you have to become a scholar, but it does mean that you have to learn the basics of the deen to be able to worship Allah. People don't know the ahkam of the juma. The man is given the khutbah, the imam, and you'll find him downstairs on the side having a discussion with someone while the Imam is given the khutbah because he doesn't know the ahkam of al Jummah. He gets married the wrong way. He gets divorced the wrong way. She doesn't wear hijab because she was never taught what the hijab is. She thinks that the hijab is what the women wear in her culture. She's not necessarily a bad lady or a bad girl. She was never sat down and explained what the hijab in al-Islam is supposed to be like. So getting knowledge is an obligation. So that companion, he could have let Rasulullah accept the message sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he stopped him. Rasulullah said to that man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallamuhu alayhi, 
الحمد لله رب العالمين هي السبع المثاني والقرآن العظيم الذي أوتيته The greatest surah of the Quran is Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Surah Al-Fatiha It is the seven oft-repeated verses that I have been given and the great Quran Since the Surah Al-Fatiha is the greatest surah of the Quran is worth our time and our effort to read about the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha Today we just completed Salat Al-Zuhr You did not read a surah today more than you read Surah Al-Fatiha because it's the seven oft repeated verses that you're going to read every day at least 17 times a day in every rakah. It is the surah that Rasulullah chose Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be read in the Salat of Al-Janazah. It is the surah that he described as Al-Ruqya. Listen to this, Ikhwani. Al-Ruqya. And Imam al-Bukhari, a Muslim, collected on the authority of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, radiyallahu anhu. The companions went out on a trip. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri was the emir, and they were 30 people all together. They came to a group of non-Muslims in the desert. They stopped and they asked those non-Muslims, would you people give us some hospitality as we're traveling, and all we want to do is have a place to rest and eat? Those people... They said, no, we're not giving you any hospitality. You're with Muhammad. You people change your religion. We're not going to fight you, but we're not going to help you either. So the companions got up and they proceeded. Allah decreed that a snake or a scorpion bit the leader of those people. A poisonous snake, a scorpion. So the man was dying. The people were in dire straits. They said, go to those people from al Medina." And ask them, do they have any herbs, any medicine to help our leader? They caught up to the companions. They told them what happened. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, yes, I have something. I have something that will cure him, inshallah. But I'll only administer the medicine if you people agree that you'll give us 30 sheep if he becomes cured. They said, okay, we agree. Die is straight. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri went back. He stood over the emir who was laying down dying. And he read, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah ar-Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Maliki yawm al-Din, seven times. After the seventh time, he spit on the man. <coughs> After that, the man got up and he started walking around as if he was okay. The Arabs gave them the 30 sheep. The companion said, give me my sheep. Everyone wants a sheep. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, no. Not until we get to Medina and we ask Rasulullah about the permissibility of what we did. All of the companions obeyed the Amir. They didn't say, yeah, but I want my sheep. I'm hungry. Give me my sheep. They obeyed the Amir. The Amir didn't do anything without asking Rasulullah. Refer the issue back to Rasulullah. They went to Medina. They told him what happened. Rasulullah started smiling. He said to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri after hearing the story, وَمَا يدريك إنها رقية أضرب لي معكم سهما. How did you know, Ya Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, that Surah Al-Fatiha is a ruqya? Give me part, a part of the meat with you. The fact that he asked for part of the meat goes to show the permissibility of what they did. Give me some of the meat of what you people took from those people. So the point is, Surah Al-Fatiha, Ikhwani, is a ruqya. So why don't we read Surah Al-Fatiha on our sick? The man was bitten by a snake or a scorpion. The man has a headache. He doesn't read Surah Al-Fatiha. He takes aspirin. The man has cancer. He has some other disease. Arthritis, rheumatism, some other issue. We rely on other resources. Go to the doctor, go to the hospital, spend money. And there's nothing wrong with that. But why not read Surah Al-Fatiha? During that time of the month, Akramakum Allah, the woman experienced severe cramps in her stomach. Read Surah Al-Fatiha. What do the Muslims do? We go to the Mirsab, the Pirsab, the hocus pocus man. He writes some words on a piece of paper, and then we tie it around our arm, tie it around our neck. He burns it into ashes. We smash up the ashes and we drink it. 
We put it in our yogurt, we put it in our food, and we eat it and we drink it. Just do what Abu Sa'id al Khudri did. Allah mentioned in the Quran about the Quran. وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ We have revealed in this Qur'an what is a shifa and a rahmah for those who believe. So Surah Al-Fatiha, al -Fatiha, Ikhwani, it is the ruqya. The last thing that I want to mention, and a lot of things should be mentioned about Surah Al-Fatiha, is that if we're going to learn about the etiquette of a dua and the importance of a dua, then Surah Al-Fatiha is a dua. And the proof that it's a dua, when you read, غَيْرَ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَنَظَّالِينَ You say, Ameen. Which is an indication, it's a dua. So inside of the surah, a number of etiquettes. We'll try to deal with four or five of them here today. The number one most important etiquette of dua that comes to us from Surah Al-Fatiha. The number one most important etiquette is that when you make dua, you make dua only to Allah. You don't make dua to a dead man in the grave. You don't make dua to the malaika, no matter how powerful they are. You don't make dua to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah. You don't make dua to Ali ibn Abi Talib. They are Muslims make dua to Ali. Ya Ali al Madid al Madid. You have to make dua to Allah and Allah alone. Where does that come from, Surah Al Fatiha? Comes from Allah's statement, Iyaka na'bud wa Iyaka nasta'in. You are the one who we worship and you are the one who we seek your help. Al Isti'ana. Look what happened with Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. And Imam al-Tirmidhi collected this hadith. And many of you know the hadith because it's in the 40 hadith of Imam al nawawi One day Rasulullah was riding on his animal and behind him was Abdullah ibn Abbas, a young man. And that goes to show the humility of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a humble man. He is the Habib of Allah. He is the Khalil of Allah. He is the Khatim of the Anbiya and the Rasul. He has the best part of a Jannah. He has the Maqam al Mahmood in a Jannah. And yet, he would allow a young boy to lie with him close. Not like some of our elders and some of us. The young man has nothing to say. Look, we don't even want, we don't even want your opinion. We'll marry you to we want to marry you to, and we'll order you to get divorced from the one we want you to get divorced from. So Allah wasn't like that. He comes around and he said to the little boy, Ya Ghulam, إِنِّي أُعَلِّمُكَ كَرِمَاتِ إِحْفَذِ اللَّهِ يَحْفَذَكَ إِحْفَذِ اللَّهِ تَجِدُهُ أَمَانِكَ وَإِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِمْ بِاللَّهِ Hey little boy, I'm going to teach you some words. Remember Allah and Allah will remember you. Remember Allah and you'll find Allah in front of you. Remember Allah in the good times, while you have good health, when you become old and infirm, inshallah, Allah will remember you. Remember Allah when you have some money by giving sadaqah, he said, Allah. When you need money, Allah is going to be there for you. Remember Allah and you'll find Him in front of you. Practice the deen. Make salat al fajr on time and the rest of the prayers and fajr, fajr and, and juma and other than that. Because when you are in need, Allah will be there in front of you, waiting for you to give you His reward, His protection. But what do we do? We forget Allah when we have good health. We forget Allah when we're young. We forget Allah when we have money. And as soon as the musibah comes, Ya Allah, Ya Allah! And Allah won't be there at that time for you. Remember Allah, Allah will remember you. Remember Allah, you'll find Him in front of you. And if you ask, ask of Allah, and if you seek the assistance or the help, al-isti'ana, wa ista'anta fasta'in billah. If you seek help, seek help of Allah. That's the meaning, iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in. Make dua to Allah and Allah only. 
تو ہم ایک دعا تو رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ و علیہ وسلم تو آپ کو قرآن دس میسج کمز اکراس ایز اللہ مچن ان قرآن ان المساجد للہ فلا تدعو ما اللہ احد the message of for Allah so do not call on anyone else do not make dua to anyone else other than Allah there are masajid in Pakistan, Kashmir, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, in Africa in the Muslim world, Arab world there are masjids where there's dead people buried inside of the masjid people make dua to them, people pray to them and then we have the nerve to turn around and say the Yahud, the Yahud the masajid are for Allah وَمَنْ كَانَ فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا Whoever was planning on meeting Allah, then only worship Allah and call on Him alone, and don't make any partners with Allah عز وجل. آيات, too many آيات. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَدُعُ رَبِّي وَلَا أُشْرِكُ بِي شَيْئًا Tell them, Ya Muhammad, I only make dua to my Lord and I don't make shit with him with anyone else. And look at this, Ikhwani. We're living in England. We're professional. We're educated. Not like some of our great, great, great grandfathers, many of which were illiterate. So they believed in that hocus pocus Islam, those strange things that intelligent people should not believe in. But even though we are educated, The person will still take a black ribbon and tie it on his car exhaust system, believing the ribbon will protect him from an accident or the evil eye. A Muslim will take a rabbit's foot, a rabbit's foot, and tie it on his car, the window there, the rear view window, and he believes that the rabbit's foot will bring him good luck. If the rabbit was so lucky, his foot wouldn't be there. He would still be running around somewhere. How do Muslims believe in such nonsense? We are educated people. How do we call on other than the Lord of all the world? Throughout the Quran, the ayat say, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ أَنَ الشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ They ask you about the sacred months. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ مَاذَ يُنْفِقُونَ They ask you, what should they spend? وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ أَنَ الْمَحِيدِ They ask you about the women's minces. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ أَنَ الْأَهِلَّةِ They ask you about the new moons. They used to ask Rasulullah about these things. So in all of these ayat, Allah would say to Rasulullah, قُلْ Tell them this, tell them that. Every ayat, they ask you about this, they ask you about that. Allah would say, tell them this, tell them that. But when it came to the issue of dua, when it came to the issue of dua, Allah said in the Qur'an, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ أَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةِ الدَّاعِ إِذَا الدَّعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُ بِهِ If my servants ask you about me, Ya Muhammad, Allah didn't say, قُلْ Like He said in all the other ayahs. If my servants ask you about me, He said, Verily, I'm close. Meaning what? We don't need Rasulullah now to tell us anything. There's no middleman. Verily, I'm close. I answer the dua of the one who calls me. You don't need any middleman. You don't need Rasulullah or anyone else. You don't need Rasulullah or anyone else. You go directly to Allah. The companions were traveling. From the sunnah of the Prophet is as if he went up a hill, he would say, SubhanAllah. And if he went down a hill, he would say, Allahu Akbar. That's his sunnah. You go on the elevator, you go up, SubhanAllah. You start to descend, decline, Allahu Akbar. So the companions were saying out loud, Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, screaming. Rasulullah told those people, Irbaw ala anfusikum, fa innakum la tadu'una ba'ida, wa la sam, tadu'una qareeban, as-sami. You people have mercy upon yourselves. Lower your voice. Save your energy. You are not calling on one who is far, far away. Nor are you calling on one who is deaf. You're calling on one who is close to you and he hears everything. You don't need a middle man. How is the educated person, intelligent person going to call on a middle man 
with all of those ayahs of the Qur'an that go to show that the little man can't help you, no matter who he is. Allah mentioned in the Qur'an, وَإِن تَدْعُوهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُوا دُعَاءَكُمْ وَلَوْ سَمِعُوا مَسْتَجَابُوا لَكُمْ If you call on them and you make dua to them, they can't hear your dua because they're dead, because they're far away. They can't hear it. And even if they could hear it, they can't help you. He may be in the next room, he may be right here. I'm making dua to the sheikh of the tarifa. Oh sheikh, oh sheikh, help me help. He can help you, even if you can hear it. In Surah Al-Hajj, Allah mentioned, Ya ayuha nas duriba mathurun fastami ulahu. In al-lazina tadu'una min dunillahi, lain yakhluqa dhubaba, walau ijtama ulahu. وَإِنْ يَسْلَبْهُمُ الْبُبَابُ شَيْئًا لَا يَسْتَنْكِذُوا مِنْهِ دَعَفَ الطَّالِبُ وَالْمَطْلُوبُ O mankind, a similar to has been given to you, so listen to this similar to from your Lord. Those people who you call on other than Allah, they cannot create a single fly. And if they all came together to create the single fly, never will they be able to do it. The fly is weak. And the ones who are calling, doing the calling are all weak. So you bring Isa, Muhammad, all of the Anbiya, all of the Malaika, all of the Awliya of Allah, all of the fake Awliya of Allah, bring all of the people together. They can't create a fly. So why make dua to them? The second etiquette, Ikhwani, that comes second in importance as well, is the etiquette of following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions in their dua. People have made up their own dua and they made up their own dhikr. And intelligent, educated, professional people follow them in this. Did Rasulullah teach that? Did Rasulullah bring that way of making a dhikr? Ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Did Rasulullah bring that? Did Rasulullah's companions show us that? Some people would get upset and they would say, look at the color of the speaker. How he has the nerve to say what he's saying. Don't become upset. I say to you and I challenge you, bring the proof of that so that we can practice it. Don't be like my mother and my father who were Christians, who used to tell us, Isa is the son of Allah. And if we were to die believing that, we would be in the hell fight. They don't have any proof of that. But that's what they believe. We have to be a group of people who can prove what we believe and our ibadat from the Quran. Whoever hears his name, kisses his thumb, and puts it to his eyes will never become blind. Kiss it. Where is that at? So your dua has to be in accordance to the sunnah, because he's the best example. Where does that come from, Surah Al-Fatiha? It comes from our dua, Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqeem, Sirat al-Ladina an'amta alayhi. Guide us to the Sirat al Mustaqim. The Sirat of those people you gave your ni'mah to. An anta alayhim. And who are they? They are the Prophet and his companions. How do we know that? The Quran explains the Quran. Someone takes the Quran and he reads, Fawaynu lil musalleen. Woe unto those who pray. So he says, I'm not praying because Allah said, Woe unto those who pray. Close the book and say, I'm not praying. Taha, wa ma anzalna alayka, ma anzalna alayka al Quran, and he stops. Taha, we did not reveal to you the Quran, and he stops. He says the Quran is not from Allah, it wasn't revealed. No, you have to read the ayats that come after it, the ayats that go before it, the ayats that are mentioned in other parts of the Quran. Surat al Alladina and Amta Alim, the Surat al Mustaqim, according to the Quran, is the way of Rasulullah. Guide us to the Surat al-Mustaqim, to the way of Rasulullah, the path of Rasulullah. 
and the path of his companion. We know that from Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 56. Allah said in Surah An-Nisa, وَمَنْ يُتِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَا الَّذِينَ أَنْأَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, then they will be with those who Allah has blessed from the Nabiyeen, Rasulullah and his brothers, and the Siddiqeen, Abu Bakr from the Siddiqeen, and the Shuhada, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and the Salihin, and the rest of the companions, Rabbi Allah Anhu. And what a good fraternity they are. So when we make dua, which is ibadah, like all other forms of ibadah, we have to follow the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So my question to this community now is, after the salawat al-khamsa, when we finish praying, Rasulullah taught us a series of du'a. Subhanallah, 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 alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, wahdullah, sharika, la lahum, mukul, awam, yuhi, wa yumita. Allahu meant to salam, meant to salam. He taught us a series of du'a that he used to say. Him and his companions. Did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ask the salawat al-khamsa? Did he start making du'a in congregation and the people made the du'a with him in congregation? He didn't do it. He didn't do it. If you want your du'a to be accepted, then make du'a the way he did. In the place that he did. The way that he did. The amount of times that he did. What is so difficult about that for this ummah? I tell you what it is. It's what he said was going to happen. You people, this ummah, you're going to follow the ways of the people went before you. A hand span by a hand span, an arm span by an arm span, to the point if they go into the lizard's hole, you are going to follow them into the lizard's hole. Meaning the Yahud and the Nasar. They worshipped Isa ibn Mari. They worshipped Uzair. They took their scholars and they took the words of the scholars and they left what was revealed to their envy and their rasul. Their women became in control and they got out of hand. They innovated in their religion. Everything that they do is going to happen to this, this Muslim, this, this community, this ummah. So the second etiquette, make dua according to his sunnah. You can't do that if you don't learn the sunnah. Number three, Ikhwani. I'm going to speed through now. From the etiquette of a dua. And everything that I mention now is secondary. It's lesser in importance and degree than the first two. Dua to Allah and dua according to the sunnah. La ilaha illallah Muhammad rasulullah The tawheed of Allah and the tawheed of following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The imam, the elders, my mother, my father, the leaders of this government, American government, the professor, the intelligent one, whenever they say something that goes against the Quran and the Sunnah, I say, La ilaha illallah. Allah deserves to be worshipped and obeyed. And only Rasulullah alone deserves to be followed and obeyed unconditionally. Everyone else is conditional. Number three. From the etiquette of a dua, ikhwani, pay attention to this. Is that you have to make al ilhah al ilhah al ilhah means to be perpetual and consistent in making the dua, and to make a dua as if you're miskeen, da'if, muhtaj, and to keep doing it and not to give up and not to let it go. Allah said in the Quran and ordering the community. ادعوا ربكم تضرعا وخفية إنه لا يحب المعتدين Call on your Lord تضرعا lowly, weak, in need and call on him in secret خفية not in front of the people make your riyah so that the people see you the dua after the salat the imam is making dua you don't know what he's saying 
Because usually they're not saying it out loud and the people are just doing all kinds of things because it's just what we're doing. Do it secretly between you and Allah, not in front of the people. And don't go overboard because Allah doesn't love those who go overboard. al ilha Where does that come from in Surah Al-Fatiha? It comes from the fact that Rasulullah described Surah Al-Fatiha Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the seven oft-repeated verses. It's a dua and you say it over and over every single day. Throughout your life, you've been making this dua every day, which is a sign. Whatever other dua you have to make, you need to make, don't make a dua and then give up from making that dua. Your mother is sick, the doctor says she has three months to live, and then you stop making dua. You have to continue to make dua until the last second. I want to get married, I've been making dua, I've been fitna, I'm young, I have this shahwa, I want to get married, fitness to Nisa, but Allah didn't make, make it happen yet. So I'm not going to give dua anymore, I'm just going to start looking. The girl is married to an oppressive husband. He's oppressive. She's under the oppression of her father. Make her get married to someone who's going to be a fitna for her in the deen. And he's only doing it because of what the people say, the culture. He'll destroy the happiness of his daughter because of the culture. She doesn't see any way out. It's something that's going to happen. So she gives up dua. The seven oft repeated verses. You have to make it again and again and again. And don't go overboard. Don't be oppressive. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, لا يزال يستجاب للعبد ما لم يدعو باسم أو قتيئة الرحم وما لم يستعجل قيل يا رسول الله كيف يستعجل قال يقول قد دعوت وقد دعوت فلم يستجاب لي فيستحسر عند ذلك فيترك الدعاء listen to this hadith the servant's dua will not cease to be accepted by Allah as long as he continues to call on Allah as long as he doesn't ask for something that's haram oh Allah I ask you to help me to win the lottery a hundred million pounds. I'll build a masjid with ten million and the rest I'll give some. La. Can't make dua for that. Oh Allah, I ask you with your, with your name to curse my mother. To destroy my wife's family. Can't make dua for something like that. Oh Allah, they threw me out of that masjid over there. I ask you to burn it down. Can't make that kind of dua. He will accept your dua as long as you don't ask for something haram and as long as you don't break off the ties of relationship. Katiyat al-Rahm. Maybe we'll come back another day to talk about that because that's important. And the third thing, and this is the point for Shahi. And as long as he doesn't find himself in haste, he doesn't rush. The companions say, Ya Rasulullah, how does the man rush in dua? He said, the man rushes in dua by saying... I made dua, and I made dua, and I made dua, and Allah didn't answer my dua, so he gives up hope, and he abandons the dua. He has to continue to make dua. You are calling on as samir al basir the one who hears and sees. al qarib wa laysa bi ba'id, he is close. wa nahnu aqrabu ilaykum min hadl al We are closer to you than your own jugular vein. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the authentic hadith has been collected by Imam al-Bukhari on the authority of al-Ubad ibn Samit radiyallahu anhu. Man da'a ma da'a al-ad rabbahu He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, من سأل الله تعالى الجنة ثلاث مرات قالت الجنة اللهم ادخل الجنة ومن استجار من لا من 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 ومن استجار من ومن استجار من النار ثلاث مرات قالت النار 
Allahumma ajirhu min an-nar. Anyone who makes dua to Allah and he asks Allah three times, Oh Allah, give me Jannah. Oh Allah, give me Jannah. Oh Allah, give me Jannah. The Jannah says, Oh Allah, put him inside of the Jannah. The person who says, Oh Allah, save me from the hellfire. Oh Allah, save me from the hell. Oh Allah, save me from the hell. The hellfire says, Oh Allah, save him from the hellfire. To make dua more and more. And this was his sunnah. He would have a problem with Quraysh. He would say, Oh Allahumma alayki bi Quraysh. Allahumma alayki bi Quraysh. Allahumma alayki bi Quraysh. Oh Allah, deal with Quraysh. Oh Allah, deal with Quraysh. Oh Allah, deal with Quraysh. So you have to continue to make dua and make the dua over and over and over and over again. And don't give up. Don't give up hope. Lastly, Ikhwani, from the mini etiquette. Another etiquette. Ah, but before that, he said in the ayat, and don't go overboard, because Allah doesn't love those who go overboard. He told us that there will be a group of people who will come, and they will go overboard in dua. One of the companions saw his son, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, saw his son making dua, and the boy said, Oh Allah, I ask for you for a white castle on the right side of Jannah with this many rooms in it. The father heard him. He said, hey, Rasulullah said there are a group of people going to go overboard in dua. Don't say that. Just ask Allah for Jannah to for the dose. That's all. And it include all everything you need. Don't be so specific like that. That's one way of going overboard. Another way of going overboard, ikhwani is, as I mentioned, to make dua against your mother, your father, the ulama, against Islam, things like that. Another way of going overboard is to abandon the dua altogether. Another way of going overboard is for an individual to follow in his dua a path other than Abu Qasim al Mustafa al Amin, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So don't go overboard in dua. The last point from the etiquette of a dua that many people forget about. And that is, when you make dua, you should make dua for the congregation. Don't make dua just for yourself. Oh Allah, I need this. Oh Allah, I need that. Give me this. Give me that. Make dua for the congregation. That come, Ihdina Sarat al Mustaqim. Guide all of us to the Sarat al Mustaqim. Allah could have revealed to Rasulullah. Ihdini as Sarat al Mustaqim. Easy. Guide me to the Sarat al Mustaqim. When you pray the Salat by yourself, those of you who can't come to Salat al Fajr, because you're far away. So you pray any prayer by yourself, at home, at work. You're making dua. Surah al Fatiha. Ihdina as Sarat al Mustaqim. You're asking for yourself. You're asking for your family who are not there. You're asking for the Muslims who are not there. I say, Dina Sarat al Mustaqim. I'm asking Allah, guide my mother and my father or kuffar to the Sarat al Mustaqim. So that etiquette shows you should make dua for the congregation and not always by yourself. Allah commanded Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah said in the Quran, Fa'lam annahu la ilaha illallah wa staqfir li dhambik wa lil mu'minina wal mu'minat. No, Ya Muhammad, that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. He told Rasulullah that. وَلَقَدْ أُوْحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْرِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَقْتَ لَيَحْبَتَنَّ عَمَلُكَ وَلَتُكُنَّنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ It was revealed to you, Ya Muhammad, and all of the prophets before you, that if you make shirk, it's going to render your deeds null and void. That's Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What about you and me? So the first ayah, know ya Muhammad that there is no God worth their worship except Allah and seek the forgiveness of Allah for your sins and seek the forgiveness for the believing men and the believing women. That's what Allah commanded Rasulullah in the Quran. So when you read the Quran, the vast majority of dua in the Quran are in the plural. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةٍ وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةٍ وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ 
Give us the good in this life. Give us the good in the next life. Save us from the hellfire and its punishment. Rabbana la tu'akhidna in nasina aw akhta'na. O our Lord, forgive us if we forget, if we make mistakes. Most of the dua are like that. رَبَّنَا إِنَّنَا سَمِعْنَا مُنَادِينَ يُنَادِي لِلْإِيمَانَ آمِنُوا بِرَبِّكُمْ فَآمَنَّا Most of the dua are like that. That's a sign that you should also make dua for the Muslim. Allah describes the believers in the Quran in Surah Al-Hashr. Pay attention to this, Ikhwani. Due to our lack of knowledge, we don't know who to love and we don't know who to hate. We love people and support people who are enemies to this religion thinking that they're okay. In Surah Al-Hashr, Allah makes this point clear when He describes the companions, radiallahu anhum, and then He describes the people who came after the companions, you and I. He said in Surah Al-Hashr, وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَ بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا ذِلَّ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ In the previous ayah, Allah described the muhajirin. Then He described the ansar. And then He said, And those people came after them. They make a dua and they say, O oh our Lord, forgive us and forgive our brothers who preceded us in faith. And do not put any hatred in our heart for them. Verily, you are Ra'uf, you are Rahim. So point number one, we make dua for ourselves and for the companions as well. O oh, our Lord, forgive us and our brothers who preceded us in Iman. And this also can mean some of you elderly people who are here, our elders. I want to spread Islam. You may not see things the same way that I see them. I shouldn't, as a younger man, I shouldn't disrespect you and be rough and tough. I have to make dua and ask Allah, don't put any hatred in my heart for those who preceded me in al Islam. But does that mean you're going to treat me like an am? Does that mean because I'm a revert and I'm after you that the hot is only with you? Doesn't mean that. But as someone who came after you, I have to respect you. You younger brothers, you have to respect the elders. That's the description that Allah gave in the Qur'an. And those who came after them, they make dua, O oh our Lord, forgive us. And forgive those who preceded us in Iman. And don't put any ghil, any enmity, hatred, rancor in our hearts against those who believe. Those people who curse the companions of Rasulullah wasallam, are they practicing this ayah? Allah described the Ansar and the Muhajireen. Then he describes those who came after them and they make dua for the Ansar and Muhajirin. Someone comes now and he says, instead of making dua for Abu Bakr and Umar, he says Abu Bakr and Umar were homosexuals. Abu Bakr and Umar were kuffar. Aisha radiallahu anha, when Rasulullah used to go out the front door to make jihad, Aisha would open up the back door and there were a line of Jews ready to have zina with her, one after another. Is this ayat describing those people? Jibreel was supposed to bring the Qur'an and he was supposed to give it to Ali but he chose to give it to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa All of the companions became kuffar after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa except five or six of them. Is this ayah describing those people? La wallahi. Like it, who like it, hate it, who hate it. You can like what I say, you can hate what I say, it doesn't make a difference. If you are against the companions of Rasulullah, you are a valim, kafir. This is the month of Ramadan. Shahr al-Ramadan al-Nabi unzi na fiil quran That Qur'an that we have, Abu Bakr and Umar radiyallahu anhu, were responsible by Allah's permission to bring it together the way it is right now. This salat al-Taraweeh, Umar radiyallahu anhu, help this Taraweeh to be established right now. How are you going to be a Muslim having a problem with those companions? You are an enemy to al-Islam. How are the Muslims going to actually think the Hezbollah of Lebanon are the Hizb of Allah. Hassan Nasrullah curses the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But because we have a lack of knowledge, 
He fights the Jews, and even though he's not beating the Jews, but someone's fighting them. But we're so far off the mark that the Muslims believe that that man is okay and his blood is okay. How would you feel, Akhi, if someone came and said that your mother who gave birth to you was a Zania? He said that your wife is a Zania. Your daughter is a Zania. Well, that's what they say about our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. Al-Muhim. That ayat described the believers as being a group of people who make dua for each other. The last thing that I want to mention about this, Ikhwani, the importance of making dua for all of the Muslims. The Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, من استقصر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات كتب الله له بكل مؤمن ومؤمنة حسنة. Whoever asks Allah to forgive all of the Muslim men and the Muslim women, Allah will write for him a hasana for every single Muslim man and every single Muslim woman who ever lived. How many people have been created from the time of Adam until this very moment from those who believe? How many? How many? Billion? Quatrillion? Oh Allah, have mercy upon me and have mercy upon all of the Muslims. Oh Allah, forgive me and forgive all of the Muslims. Allah help me and help all of the Muslims. Every time he makes that kind of dua, there's a hasana for every single believer that ever lived, ever. Don't be of the people who, oh Allah give me this, oh Allah give me that, oh Allah give me this. That's okay. But don't forget your family. Don't forget the Muslims. There was another man who Rasulullah saw him making dua. And the man raised his hand and just started making dua. Rasulullah said, you have oppressed. He said, why ya Rasulullah? He said, because you went straight in the, into the dua by just asking for yourself. He said, if one of you wants to make dua, then let him glorify Allah first. And then let him send salutations upon me, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then let him make dua for whatever he wants to make dua for. So, ikhwani, we have to come to learn about this ibadah. There are things that you can do to make your du'a accepted. There are certain times that you have to know about that will make your du'a accepted. There are certain things that you can do that will make your du'a rejected. We have to come to learn about that. We're fasting in the month of Ramadan. Why don't we use this weapon of du'a? And Imam Abu Hanifa, he had a number of enemies. And Imam Abu Hanifa... He used to say, Rahimullah Ta'ala as an Imam, as Dahabi brought in his book, Sir al Nubala. He used to say, when someone came and told him about what some of the envious, jealous people were saying about him, lying about him, he said, no problem. I'm going to shoot the arrows of the night time at him. You know what the arrows of the night time is? All right. Those are the hours when you get up in the last third of the night to make Qiyamul Layl and you ask Allah to get your enemy, to deal with your enemy. The dua of the oppressed is accepted. The dua of the father and the mother for the child is accepted. The dua of the mother and the father against the child is accepted. The dua between the Adhan and the Iqama is accepted. The dua on Friday is accepted. The dua at the door of the Kaaba is accepted. The dua of the traveler is accepted. The dua of the one who is earning are halal is accepted. The dua of the girl, the lady who puts her hands up to the sky and raises her hands up while making dua is accepted. And Allah hey, hey, yastahi and yarfa abdu ilayhi yadayi fa yurdu ma sifra khaibati. Allah is living and he's most generous. He is shy for his slave to raise his hands to him and then Allah doesn't put anything in his hands. So Rasulullah would pray like this. He would pray like this. And the day of Badr he used to pray like this. Oh Allah, if this small band of people for my companions are destroyed, then you won't be worshipped on the face of the earth. And he would exaggerate. You can go. And you can ask a righteous brother, you think he's righteous? Abdullah, make dua for me. But after asking him, you shouldn't sit there like this. 
doing the haram, Abdullah is, is making dua for me. You ask him to make dua for you, and you hope that Allah would accept it. But for us to go to Al Medina, to go to the grave of Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, my wife, she can't get pregnant, help the situation, it's haram. Rasulullah can hear in his grave. He can hear, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's praying in his grave. The Hayat al Barazakhiyah. Sallallahu wa sallamu alayhi. But he can't do anything. He can't help anything. The way that he helps us is by us following his sunnah. So we're going to stop here, inshaAllah ta'ala. If anything was said that was right and exact, then that's from Allah wahduhu la sharika la. If anything that was said that was wrong and correct, then that's from me and Shaytan. I take refuge in Allah Azza from the evil of Shaytan. And if anyone felt offended or anything by it like that, as a result of what I'm said, as a result of what I said, don't be offended. That wasn't my intent to offend you. But I don't apologize. Our religion is that Quran and the authentic Sunnah, the way the companions understood it. If we continue to hold on to our cultures, we're going to remain divided. I hold on to my culture. You hold on to your culture. We're going to remain divided. اتبعوا ما أنزل إليكم من ربكم ولا تتبعوا من دونه أولياء. Hold on to what was revealed to you from your Lord and don't hold on to anything other than that. وإذا قيل لهم اتبعوا ما أنزل الله قالوا بل نتبع ما ألفينا عليه آباءنا أولو كان آباءهم لا يعقلون شيئا ولا يهتدون. When it is said to them follow what Allah revealed they say, no, we're going to follow what we found our fathers doing. Allah said, even though their fathers don't know anything, they can't even read and write. Some of their fathers can't even read and write in Jahiliyyah. And this is an example of some Muslims as well. When it is said to them, follow what Allah revealed, they say, no, we're going to follow what we, follow, what we found our fathers doing. Even though their fathers can't, they don't have any knowledge and they're not guided or right. Okay, Khwani, I'm going to stop now asking Allah Azzawajal by His ism and A'zam to have mercy upon all of us and all of the Muslims and to forgive all of us and all of the Muslims and to establish our feet firmly upon the Kitab and the Sunnah and to make us all people of a Tawheed and to enter us into His Jannah to the those and to save our faces collectively from the Adab of the Naar. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah wa lakum ونسأل الله تعالى التوفيق والسداد